Okay. Now we go. All right. Welcome uh, back to our uh, Thursday night's New York Giants Preservation Society meeting. Uh, for today, December 2nd, we have a great guest, Corey Bush. Um, tell you a little bit about him, but just let me let you know what's going on for the rest of this calendar year. Uh, in two weeks, I'm going to be showing um, the end of an era. Uh, Mo Resna was on a couple of weeks ago, and I finally figured out how to share my screen. So with all the holidays coming on, I thought it'd be a nice, uh, it's like a 39 minute film. There's about 18 or 19 minutes of uh, actual footage from the polo grounds, the last game there. Um, very informal, I think it'll be very nice. And uh, hopefully we'll see you then. Uh, What's the date for that? The two, week, two weeks from today, yep. Okay. Um, and if you <laughs> like it, you know, you get to, I'll give you the person to get in touch with to, uh, to make a purchase. Um, but it is, it is an excellent, excellent film. Um, by the way, Russ, nice to see you. Hope everything's well. You know, we heard last night about this uh, strike looming. So uh, that's not good, but we, we are not on strike here. So we will uh, continue to try to uh, <laughs> give you some sort form of uh, baseball entertainment uh particularly with the giants it's, um, a, it's a lockout gary not a strike i'm yeah. sorry thank you my, my, my first That's lockout was lawyer Harvey, you know. I'm my sorry, first Russ. lockout was 1990 with cory bush so <laughs> anyway today uh tonight we have cory bush uh, when i started really understanding baseball the way a fan should Corey was uh, with the Giants and, you know, with Bob Laurie. Uh, he worked in the, uh, for Governor Moscone in San Mayor Francisco. Mayor. 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 Mayor Moscone. Mayor, I'm sorry. Mayor Moscone in San Francisco. Um, and at that time, you know, most of you are upset that the Giants were uh, leaving New York. And at that time, the Giants were going to be leaving San Francisco. So he's going to be talking about that in his career with the Giants. You know, they were going to be moving to Toronto. And near the end of his tenure, you know, they were going to be moving to Tampa. But uh, and Bob Laurie is also on board tonight. So we have really Corey and, and Bob, uh, uh, Giant Legacies and Royalty. And Corey, we cannot thank you enough for joining us for this evening. So oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, thank you for having thank me. Thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours, Corey. Well, I, you know, uh, Gary asked me to just give some brief um, biographical information, a little bit about my careers in baseball and politics. And so I'm going to try to keep it brief because I'm sure you, you have a lot of questions on and things on your mind you'd like to discuss. So I'll, I'll try to do that. Plus, um, since Bob Lurie's on the line, he likes he, he hates it when I go way too long. Uh, which I tend to do sometimes. <laughs> so Bob, Bob will be my monitor. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate. I had two passions uh, growing up. One was baseball and the other was politics. And um, for some reason, I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to do both during my professional career. Um, I was introduced to my first professional baseball game in the mid-50s when I was six or seven years old when my dad, who was a transplanted New Yorker, uh, he moved, his family moved from New York to Los Angeles when he was a teenager, took me to see the Hollywood stars of the old Pacific Coast League in the mid fifties. Uh, there were two PCL teams in LA, the stars and the angels. And that was my, he, he was very excited about taking his, his, only, his oldest son uh, and introducing him to baseball. And I remember going to a place called Gilmore Field in LA seeing my first professional baseball game and uh, loving every minute of it. Then when the Dodgers moved out, Dodgers and Giants moved to California in 58, um, the first major league game I saw was at the LA Coliseum uh, in 1958. And I had the sort of penultimate baseball experience. I walked through the long tunnel. For those of you who haven't been to the LA Coliseum, it was built uh, for the 32 Olympics, and it's a track, it's a huge track and field stadium at the time, sat 104,000, and it had these very long tunnels that you had to walk through from the concourse to the seating area. Um, uh, 
there were tunnels in those days when I worked for the Giants. I found out they're actually called vomitories. Um, so I walked through that. I walked through that very long tunnel, and it was a night game. And I got to the other end, and I saw that Major League Baseball field under the lights, and I was hooked. I was just hooked. Um, I just knew this was for me, and I've had a lifelong love affair with the game ever since. Never in my wildest dreams that I think I'd ever be given the opportunity to uh, to make a living. In, in Major League Baseball, and I owe that to Bob Lurie. Um, but I've been, a, I've been a passionate fan uh, ever since that, that first time I went to the LA Coliseum. Um, I got interested in politics a few years later in 1960 when John Kennedy ran against Richard Nixon. And there was something about Kennedy that, that caught my eye. Um, I lived in a household where FDR was sort of a hero and um, my parents were semi-involved politically. And so I, I got interested in politics then and uh, grew up in LA, went to UCLA, graduated, and uh, was given an opportunity uh, while I was still a student to work for George Moscone, do some work with George Moscone actually, who at that time was the state Senate majority leader. And I was doing some work for a political consulting firm in Los Angeles. And, Moscone used to come down to Southern California to campaign for Democrats in order to keep his majority in the Senate. And um, as a young kid at UCLA at the time, I was assigned to do some work with him, drive him around, do scheduling, that kind of stuff. Um, we got to know each other and he offered me a job uh, when I graduated in 1971. So I moved to San Francisco right away, which was a great upgrade for me from LA to San Francisco. Uh, worked for George. And then uh, for several years, uh, including when he became mayor, I was his press secretary. And of course, the very, almost the very first thing that happened to him right after he was sworn in is Horace Stoneham announced that the Giants had been sold to the Batch Brewery in Toronto, Canada, and they were gonna leave um, and play uh, beginning the 1976 season in Canada. And you have to, you know, bear in mind that that was a long time ago. The Giants had only been in San Francisco, I think, for about 18 years uh, when that occurred. And of course, Moscone, having been mayor for 28 or 48 hours when that news broke, wasn't too keen on the idea of having the first thing happen to him in his administration was losing his Major League Baseball team. Well, the very first call he got was from Bob Lurie. Um, Bob called the mayor and said, I want to do whatever I can to keep the Giants here, including uh, putting up money to buy them. And I met Bob, I believe Bob, it was on a Saturday that uh, George was sworn in as mayor on Thursday. I think you and he and I met his office on Saturday. And uh, you said to him, you, you'd be willing to put up half the money to buy the team to keep them in San Francisco. Uh, Moscone went to court, got a temporary restraining order to keep the team from leaving. And through some back channel communication, it was made clear to the mayor that if the $8 million price that the brewery was going to pay for the Giants could be matched by a local group willing to keep them in San Francisco, that the uh, restraining order would be, would, would be turned into an injunction and the team would stay. Um, as I said, Bob came forward immediately, said he put up half the money to do that. And for the next couple of months, he and George Moscone and I and with other people set out to try to find the other $4 million. Uh, nobody in San Francisco, nobody other than Bob was willing to put up a dime to keep the team. Candlestick um, had been open for over a decade. Uh, it was clear that that ballpark was a real impediment to any kind of financial sustainability for the team. And there just was nobody in San Francisco other than fans who yeah, wanted to keep the team. And, but over a, a, a whole chain of events and we can talk about it um, as, as we go through the evening, mm -hmm. uh, if you're interested, if you want, you want to know more detail, Bob partnered up with a man from Arizona named Bud Herseth, bought the team at the last minute um, and as they say, the rest is history. So that's sort of, you know, my background in both politics and you baseball. Know, I was privileged to serve 
uh, um, with Bob on the Giants yeah. for 14 years through 1992, which was Bob's last season of ownership. And um, was uh, involved in uh, many of the aspects of the organization. Um, I became executive vice president and I used to describe my job as saying that everybody who didn't play uh, reported to me. Um, there were a series of um, people from Speck Richardson to Tom Howard to Al Rosen who ran the baseball side of the business uh, and I helped run the business side of it. And, um, you know, that's sort of my mini biography. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to talk about uh, any aspect of, of my time with the Giants um, what it took to keep the team here, what happened in, in 1992 uh, when it looked like the team might move to Tampa, um, uh, and uh, anything else you'd like to chat about. Corey, thank you so much. Before we get started, Mrs. Lori, if you hit share video, the, the screen should come on. All right. Um, Corey, thank you so much. Anybody have a question? Uh, we could do it the normal way with the raising of the hands or if you want to hit your button. But we'll go with Dan and then Ed Freer. Dan Taylor. Corey, I'm, I'm curious, how surprising was it to get the call from Bud Herseth? And can and you and perhaps Mr. Lurie uh, take us through uh, your reaction and, and, and how that quickly transpired? Well, it's a, it's a, it's an, it's a kind of an interesting story because we had gone through um, uh, the situation with Bob Short, who original, originally came forward and was willing to <clears throat> put up the other half of the money to be Bob's partner. But the National League had made it clear that if there was going to be a partnership between Bob Lurie and Bob Short, that Bob Lurie had to be the controlling partner. <clears throat> uh, baseball had had an experience, as you know, with Bob Short in, in the past and uh, they wanted Bob Lurie to run the club. And after a number of meetings, and, and maybe Bob would, would care to share more detail, uh, Bob, uh, Bob Short bowed out because he really wasn't interested in, um, in being the minority partner. So we had uh, gone, looked high and low for a partner and had gotten to the point where the National League was getting ready to approve the deal to Labatt's. We were really down to the last day or two. Okay. And I had come back from lunch and got a message slip from my secretary that a fellow named Bud Herseth had called me about the Giants. Now, you can imagine by that time I was getting calls from every, every kid, every baseball fan in San Francisco. So I saw Bud Herseth and I thought, well, it's, it's some kid in the Richmond district, maybe, you know, a buddy of Lincoln Mitchell's at the time, uh, <laughs> you know, who was willing to give everything he had in his piggy bank mm -hmm. to keep, to keep mm -hmm. the Giants. So. I really didn't pay a lot of attention to it. My secretary said, you really ought to call this guy back. He's calling from Arizona. So I called him and uh, he explained to me that he knew uh, that we were trying to find a partner to buy the club and he wanted to know the details of the sales. So I walked him through the details. And when I was finished, he said to me, well, I understand there's some real estate in Arizona. And I said, well, there is some real estate in Arizona. The Giants do own real estate in Casa Grande which originally was going to be a spring training site. Uh, but I explained to Mr. Herseth that the real estate was not part of the deal. And I thought at that point, he was gonna say, well, thank you very much. I wish you all the luck in the world, but he didn't. He said, well, I am very interested in doing this. Um, I've been fortunate. I've made some money in my life. I played a little high school baseball and I'd like to help out. I have $4 million in certificates to deposit. Here's the name of my banker. Why don't you check me out, talk to Mr. Lurie and call me back. So I hung up and I immediately ran down the hall to the mayor's office and I told him about it. And he asked me if I thought the guy was for real. And I said, hard to tell, but it sounded like it. So the mayor immediately got him on the line and started speaking with him. And midway through the conversation, he said to me, covered the phone and said, call Bob Lurie. This guy I think is for real. So I called Bob and I told him what was going on and uh, gave him her Seth's phone number. And the two spoke on the phone. And by the end of the afternoon, they had reached an agreement to buy the team. And there was a conference call with the National League, actually before the Herseth call came in, where they were telling Bob, the time is up. 
And I could, Bob, I could I for you, if you can give me. Corey Bob asked for more time. And I think if I remember correctly, Bob, they said, okay, you've got till five o'clock. So Corey. there was another, there was another call that afternoon and Maybe Bob explained to them the situation with Bud Herseth. Herseth flew to San Francisco. And that next morning, Bob and he agreed on the terms of the deal. Uh, and uh, we informed the National League. And uh, Bob and Bud Herseth bought the club and, and kept them in San Francisco. Corey, maybe to, can I uh, pre just come in for a minute? Please. Uh, I had gotten a call from Jim Feeney, president of the National League, previous to Bud Herseth coming on the scene. And so the National League owners would like to talk to you. And I met with them on a phone call at noon and discussed the matter and said, I'd like 48 hours to review the situation. Because a lot of the owners did not like Candlestick and were very happy to have the club go to Toronto. Walter O'Malley was obviously didn't want to see the rivalry leave, and he was very helpful in convincing them to try to convince them to give me the 48 hours. In their great judgment, they gave me five hours and said, Come back at five o'clock, and if you can't swing the deal by then, the club's going to Toronto. So it was a very exciting five hours. I found people, I called people saying that uh, you indicated an interest in being with the Giants. It turned out that all the people I called were out to a four hour lunch. So nobody showed up, nobody listened, but at five o'clock, as Corey explained, Bud Hurst says, came on the scene and we made the deal. At an exciting five hours. Hey, Bob, on behalf of the group, we uh, congratulate you on having uh, your name inducted onto the Giant Wall of Fame. Well deserved. So on behalf of us, thank you for all you did for the Giants. Well, it was a very exciting day. I'll tell you, it was a fabulous. All right, let's go to, we're going to go to Ed, then Charles, and then Mars. Ed Freer, you're up. Okay, thank you. Uh, on a much smaller scale, uh, but kind of a small world story. I grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York and knew a fellow named Jim Kelly, who I later met his father, uh, who I knew personally before that. And he had a number of uh, letters and memorabilia posted up from the mayor on how Jim Kelly, the fellow I knew had helped save the Giants. And the connection was he had a restaurant. I believe the Braves used to mention it. Have you heard of Pat O'Shea's Oh, yeah. Restaurant? Sure. Because when I was in San Francisco about 20 years ago, almost, I couldn't find it. But was he instrumental in helping save the Giants on a smaller scale? Jim Kelly? Yeah, from Pat O'Shea's restaurant. Bob, it doesn't, get... it doesn't ring a bell with me, Bob, does it with you? Absolutely not. We've had a lot of restaurants, but not well, familiar he, with that one, or, or Mr. Kelly. Yeah, he had some letters from the mayor, anyway. From uh, from Mayor Moscone? Yeah. <laughs> that must have been some kind of small-time campaign, because I think the sports announcers used to stop at that restaurant, and uh, maybe he had, I don't know, charity box or something. But the, I just thought on a smaller scale, a small <clears throat> world, I mention that. No, it doesn't sound familiar to me. Okay. Charles, you're up. All right, I do remember Pat O'Shea's. I, I'm trying. I can't remember where it is, but I remember the restaurant in the city. Uh, my question was for Corey, and actually, this is courtesy of Lincoln, who said I need to ask you the question about uh, Mr. Lurie at the All Star Game in 1976. Uh, I'm hoping you'll tell that story. Oh, you, no, it was with George Moscone at the All Star right. Game in 1976. Oh, okay. Uh, I was working for the mayor then. Um, okay. It was the Democratic National Convention in New York City. It was the convention where Jimmy Carter was nominated. So we went back and we were at the convention and it happened to be at the same time as the All-Star Game in Philadelphia. So <laughs> um, we decided let's go to the All-Star Game. Let's take the train one, you know, that day and we'll go down to Philly and we'll go to the All-Star Game and we'll take the train back to New York. 
So we were able to finagle some tickets. There were four or five of us in our group. And so we go down to, um, I guess it was Penn Station to get on the train. And these two guys walk up to George Moscone, not knowing who he is, and identify themselves as reporters from the Philadelphia Inquirer. And they're doing a story on what convention goers in New York uh, are doing. And they said, would you mind if we spoke to you? And he said, no, of course not. He said, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm here for the convention. He goes, you're getting on the train to Philadelphia. Why are you going to Philadelphia? He says, well, we're going down for the All-Star game. He says, oh, well, that, they said, that's interesting. They said, can we ask you, what do you do for a living? And he says, well, I'm the mayor of San Francisco. So they got all excited and thought, wow, they've got a great story here. They got the mayor of San Francisco going to, going to Philadelphia for the All-Star game. So they said, would you mind if we rode down with you and did a, a longer interview? And he said, no, of course not. So we all get on the train and we're not sitting together because there weren't you know, a, enough seats together. So these two guys <clears throat> sit down with the mayor and I'm sitting somewhere else and with another couple of, of friends that people we were with. And we get to Philadelphia and we get off the train and I walk up to these two guys and I said, uh, excuse me, I, I saw you talking to the other man at length. What, what was that all about? And he says, oh, this is great. We were talking to people who go to the convention and what are they doing? And we found out that he was going to Philadelphia for the All-Star game. And I said, well, let me ask you something. And they go, what? I said, did he give you that shit about being the mayor of San Francisco? And their faces <laughs> turned white. <laughs> we all started laughing and George came over and introduced me and, and we all got a big laugh out of it. But you should have seen the looks on their faces initially uh, when they thought they had gotten this big, Big story with the mayor, and I gave him that line. It was, I think that's the story Lincoln was talking about. I, it probably is. It sounds like a, it sounds like a story Lincoln would have liked. Yeah. Or, you know. Mars, you're up. By the way, I think John O'Shea's uh, was on Geary Boulevard in the Richmond district. But the questions I have, the first is I, I understand that Bud Hurst said Bob Lurie bought him out after a year or two to take complete control. And then the question is, um, was Bob short in any kind of shenanigans where they didn't want him to be a partner or an owner? Well, Bob can speak to this more than, than I can, but um, they, the position of the National League was made pretty clear to Bob Lurie, which was, we're okay with your partnership with Bob Short, but you, Bob Lurie, must be the managing general partner. Uh, and again, I, um, I don't know what kind of detail they went into with Bob on that, but, you know, Bob Short had owned, um, uh, I believe it was the Texas uh, Rangers, <clears throat> or maybe it was Washington, moved to Texas. I, I get confused on that stuff now. But um, they had had experience with Bob Short as an owner. And uh, like I said, they, they were okay with him being a partner of Bob's, Bob Lurie, but they wanted Bob Lurie to be the managing partner. <laughs> Bob, That's I don't know if there's any more detail that you know. Pretty accurate, there. Corey. Baseball really uh, did not like Bob Short. Mars, did you have another question you want? You said there were two things. Well, uh, no, but um, uh, thank you, Corey, for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Before I go to Dan, Corey, I got a question for you. Um, you were there basically with Bob for the rebirth of the team when they finally started getting better. Did you know right away that uh, Will Clark, Robbie Thompson, Matt Williams, that they were the real deal and they were going to lead the Giants into a new direction? Well, I think it was pretty clear from the beginning that Will Clark was going to be a major star in, in baseball. Um, you know, he'd had a great uh, collegiate career. Um, didn't spend much time in the minor leagues. And of course, the very first time he swung a bat in the big leagues, he took Nolan Ryan deep to center field in the Astrodome. So I don't think that, um, that Will Clark's success came as a surprise to anybody. It was, it was pretty well expected. Matt Williams got off to a slow start, um, a world of talent, and everybody, all the scouting reports on him were, were great. But he got off to a very slow, tough start. Um, but then obviously came into his own and turned into a, a real high quality player. And Robbie Thompson was just the kind of player that 
uh, everybody knew could contribute and make a good club a better club. Robbie was a smart ball player, a hard-nosed ball player, um, played a key defensive position up the middle, um, put the ball in play, and was a great situational hitter. So, again, with, with Robbie and Matt, I would, I would have to say that there were expectations um, that they would achieve what they did. With Will Clark, um, it, it was pretty well believed that Will Clark was going to step right in and be a force in, in the major leagues. And one last question relating to Will Clark. I, I remember that he left the Giants over a contract. Uh, I think uh, Texas offered him one more year or whatever. Um, my feeling was that if he stayed with the Giants, he'd be a Hall of Famer. Not just the Giant retired number, but you know, possibly in Cooperstown. What, what are your feelings about that? Well, I, I don't know, you know, um, if things would have been a whole lot different had he stayed than, than not. I, I do know that there are people in baseball and there were some people in the Giants organization who felt that when Will was in the batting race with Tony Gwynn and finished second, and I don't remember what year it was, um, it changed Will's approach. Um, he wanted to be more uh, of an average hitter. He wanted to win that batting championship. Um, and he was, he was a, a guy who had to had to put up power numbers. That's what was expected of him. And he sort of changed his approach at that point um, and became less of a home run RBI guy and you know more of a guy who would go the other way, um, get some singles, be more of an average hitter. That might have had more of an impact on his career than going to Texas. Plus he had a had an elbow injury uh, and was reluctant to have surgery. Um, and I don't know ultimately if he ever did, but he did not have the surgery when he was with the Giants. So those two factors might have had an impact. But I think when Will first came up and people saw him um, and the kind of ball player he was and the kind of hitter he was, you know, he looked like a Hall of Famer. He looked like a guy who could maybe win a triple crown one day. Uh, he was something and it just had that beautiful left-handed swing. But um, like I said, the there are those who think that the race with Tony Gwynn and, the, and not getting elbow surgery uh, might have had an impact on his career going forward. Thank you so much. Dan, you're up. Sure. Before I ask my question, just because you were talking about Will Clark, um, and apart from his great swing and the production he did, I just remember when he came to the team in 86. And I've never, at that time, I've never seen a Giants player that had more what I would just call attitude on the field than him. And then when you factor that in with Kevin Mitchell, who came the following year, and Jeffrey Leonard, um, I'm hard pressed to think of a baseball team that had three players that just brought, I mean, you can just see the intensity on their faces. It was like watching a football team sometimes. What uh, about the pitchers they got? Yeah, they were, they were, uh, they were kind of unique too. <laughs> no, but you're right. Um, those guys, all three of those guys came to play every day. Um, and, and Will was more vocal than Kevin or, or Jeff for sure. Hackman was kind of quiet. Um, Will was a pretty vocal leader in the clubhouse, on the field. He's, you know, we were very much a, a, a go-go, rah-rah kind of guy. Whereas Kevin and, and Hack, their leadership was a little different. But uh, they were all really tough ball players. And like I said, they showed up every day to play and play hard. It was an Al Rosen put together team. No, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's, that, those were the kind of ball players Al Rosen liked. Um, I remember when Al first came to the Giants, one of the first things he wanted to do was acquire Dwayne Kuyper. Now, we already had a pretty decent second baseman named Joe Morgan. But Frank wanted Kuyper because of the type of ball player he was. Hard-nosed, get dirty, mix it up, um, smart, uh, good defensive player. Uh, good situational hitter. He was the kind, I remember Frank would, would describe the kind of player he wanted to be as a role model, as an example for other players on the club. That's the kind of kind of guy Frank liked and the kind of guy that Al Rosen liked. Well, the, the, the question I had actually was about, um, especially if you read Lincoln's book that covers the Giants from 1972, or I'm sorry, 1976 to 1992. Um, I think it's because I work in law. I just saw there's so many things that you worked on during that time, ballot initiatives, 
um, probably dealing with citizens. I mean, just so much. You need lawyers. You need a legal team. So I'm, I'm kind of familiar with the Giants and who they had working in law in the 60s and probably in the 90s, but I don't know if it's a continuous relationship. Did you have an in-house legal department that kind of handled all this or more accurately would it be outside and what I think you used was McCutcheon, Doyle, Brown and Anderson. That might've been one of your major firms, but if you could just kind of take me through like how you, how you use legal, your legal means to deal with problems during that time. Cause you sure had a, a, a boatload of them. Yeah. McCutcheon Doyle was the firm that we used uh, and the partner there was just a wonderful, wonderful man and a terrific lawyer named Jim Hunt. Now Jim Hunt represented Horace Stoneham in the National Exhibition Company when uh, the city of San Francisco went to court to try to stop the Giants from leaving. So Jim Hunt was actually our adversary at that time, but he was so smart and so good and uh, had, a, had a way about him that even as an adversary, uh, you couldn't dislike him. Uh, you had to have a lot of respect for him. And I think, you know, once again, as soon as the deal closed and Bob bought the club, Bob knew right away that he wanted to keep Jim Hunt as the attorney. And so Jim worked with us um, throughout the entire time that Bob owned the club. And he worked with us <clears throat> on a number of things, had a partner in his firm who did the arbitrations for us. Jim worked with us on uh, um, all the issues with the city and building a new ballpark and all the other kinds of legal things that come up that came up during that time. We did have, we didn't have an in-house counsel. We did have a, uh, a lawyer who worked for us um, who did some minor contract work and did some, you know, HR kinds of things uh, and worked closely with me on, on some of the ballpark stuff by the name of Mike Shapiro. But uh, all of our of legal work was under the direction of Jim Hunt. Um, so the McCutcheon firm, it sounds like it was a Horace Stoneham connection then, that somehow he established the relationship before, that's right. you, before he came that's on the right. scene? When we met Jim Hunt, he was working for uh, Horace in, in trying to get the club to move to Canada. Um, and I can't say enough about Jim. He, he was just a wonderful guy, passed away several years ago, way too young, um, as, as fine a, a human as he was uh, a, a lawyer. Great, thank you, and thank, thanks for coming. Corey, what was what was uh, your best part of working for the Giants? Did you realize? Boy, that's hard to say. I mean, it's a dream come true when you grow up a baseball fan, and and you know when I when I was growing up a baseball fan in the fifties, late fifties, sixties, uh, I grew up a Dodger fan. You should pardon the expression, but I was living in LA in the sixties, <laughs> and you know they had some pretty pretty good teams to root for with Colfax and Drysdale and Tommy Davis and Willie Davis and Maury Wills and, and uh, some pretty good teams. Um, and we got to see some pretty good teams too, uh, particularly when the Giants came to town. I hated the Giants, but there were two, two players that played for the Giants that you couldn't hate. And that was, those were the two Willies. Uh, Mays and McCovey, all you could do as an opponent was stand in awe and be appreciative of what they did on a baseball field. Um, so, you know, but in those times, the idea of working in baseball never crossed my mind because it seemed like it at the time, it, it seemed like, and I think it was, you know, very incestuous. You almost had to be born to it. And in those days, um, front offices were very small. They didn't have the big, you know, marketing and publication and retail sales and all the things that developed over the years. So I never, I never even dreamt of working in baseball. So when the opportunity came along with Bob, uh, I, I had to just pinch myself. What was the best part? I don't know. I, I mean, getting to know the people in the game, certainly some of the great players um, that I got to know over the years, the Hall of Famers I got to know, uh, the two Willies, for example, um, getting to know Juan Marshall, other than the guy that the Dodgers couldn't beat and, and who hit John Roseboro with a bat and finding out that he's one of the nicest, gentlest, most wonderful men you'll ever meet. Um, the players, the people in the front office, getting to know uh, people like that um, who, who have a shared passion uh, for the game, um, you know, is, is about as good as it gets. Uh, 
getting paid to go to baseball games. That was pretty good. Uh, I enjoyed that. You know, it, it's hard to pinpoint one thing. It really is. Being able to get an autographed baseball to give to some kid and just seeing the look on his face and being able to identify with that, because I remember the first autographed baseball I got as a kid, that's pretty cool. I mean, it's very cool to be able to do things like that and to be in a position to do things like that. So hard to pick one thing, um, but uh, it's, it's an experience that um, I'm just so grateful I, I had. Yeah, you know, I just wanted to mention also, uh, you know, being 3,000 miles away, you and Bob, uh, we feel like we knew you because whenever the Mets were on, there was always you sitting next to Bob in the stands and the camera would always, you know, during a game, shoot over and they would say, there's, there's Corey Bush and, and, and the owner of the Giants, Bob Lurie. So that's why a lot of the guys here are, already feel like they know you. Uh, Dan Levitt, you're up. Well, th th this is great. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just curious. You mentioned uh, Walter O'Malley. How did some of the other owners line up? Can you just talk about if they're, you know, who, who was else was sort of pushing to help you guys stay and who was like, just let him go. And how about Bowie Kuhn? I mean, I'm just curious sort of how some of the other folks lined up either way. Well, I think Bob, you know, said it pretty well. Um, the league was kind of fed up with San Francisco. Uh, the ballpark was a disaster. It was pretty clear that um, the Giants just were not going to survive long term in Candlestick Park. Um, th there was a feeling that the city wasn't prepared to do much about it. Uh, and I think there were those who thought that uh, baseball would be better off with the team in Canada. But as Bob said, you know, Walter O'Malley didn't didn't go to great lengths to talk Horace Stoneham out of moving the New York Giants to Minneapolis um, because he just felt like that was the right thing to do. Walter O'Malley wanted the Giants in California, uh, and he certainly didn't want them to leave. Uh, that rivalry, I, well, I don't have to tell you what that rivalry means and what it meant to baseball. And of course, at that time, Walter O'Malley was a major force in Major League Baseball back in 1976. Still a, a a very influential member of the National League. So he was really the guy who was doing everything he could to help Bob um, to, to buy the club and to, and to have the time necessary to do that. Um, I, I can't remember, Bob, maybe you do, you know, any other particular owners that were either very strong one way or the other. Um, I think it was really a matter of there didn't appear to be a solution. Bob was the only San Franciscan who came forward and we're talking two months that had gone by and nobody else came forward willing to, to put up the money to, with Bob to buy the team. So I think it was just kind of sort of an accepted conclusion that the team was going to leave until Herseth came forward. And at that point, uh, when you had um, the ability to, when there was enough money there to buy the team to make Horace Stoneham whole in the sense that he would get the same $8 million from the Lurie Herseth uh, team as he would from Labatt's, uh, then the league was was quick to approve it. Mars, go well, ahead. I don't know if you if okay. you remember any other owners that were particularly involved one way or the other, other than O'Malley. No, no, pretty with pretty much O'Malley. It convinced them. Mars, go ahead. Well, you mentioned about you know Will Clark. Robbie Thompson, Matt Williams, Kevin Mitchell. Uh, they had a great pitching staff. Russell, Robinson, uh, a, a Beck, the reliever, and then Mike Kuko mm -hmm. came along. And I remember the last game of the season, I think it was against the Dodgers in 82, where Kuko had 19 86. wins. And, uh, and they brought in Kuko, I think, in the fifth inning to finish the game, to get Roger Craig brought him in to win his 20th game. One of the big mistakes the Giants made was not uh, – Brett Butler was asking for like $12 million. They could have settled maybe for $10 million. He's the best leadoff hitter the San Francisco Giants ever had, and they let him go to the Dodgers. Back before that, what really ceased to amaze me is that Horace Sonam never went out to Candlestick. 
he he delegated other people to go there to see what it was like. Had he gone there at three o'clock in the afternoon when the wind kicked up, he said, no way do I want to play here. You know, so, you know, he he delegated people to do a lot of his tasks. He wasn't really involved. He lost the team in two cities. He never tried to get an investment group, which is why I believe he should not go to the Hall of Fame. On the other hand, O'Malley, who a lot of people in New York hate, as well as stone him, you know, he was more, uh, had a much more business acumen. So, you know, Candlestick Park was actually the death knoll where the Giants, you know, were ready to leave first to Toronto and then the to Florida. It was Candlestick Park picking the wrong place to begin with. Yeah, well, let me, uh, let me comment on both of those. The Brett Butler situation, as you may recall, was when uh, Major League Baseball was found to have been in collusion um, to um, on free agency <clears throat> and the arbitrator um, voided a number of contracts as part of the punishment to baseball for colluding um, to hold free agent contracts down. Brett Butler's contract with the Giants was one of those that was voided. Um, now Al Rosen said several years later that not keeping Brett in that situation was probably the biggest mistake he'd ever made. So if Al were with us today, uh, he would agree with you that uh, letting Butler go at that point was a mistake. Um, I think there was, a, there was a lot of residual resentment that certain teams law, had key players' contracts voided while other teams didn't. And um, I don't know if that was any kind of a factor in Al's thinking, um, we, uh, but the fact of the matter is that after it took place, um, Al regretted letting, uh, letting Butler go. He was a great leadoff hitter. He was a, <clears throat> a great team leader, uh, and he certainly helped the Dodgers when he got down to L.A. Uh, in, I in wrote to Fred Butler. Just, uh, he wrote me a letter, one of the few players that ever did, and said, I did not get involved enough with my agent. I really wanted to stay with the Giants, and I loved my time with it, et cetera. So it was interesting that he would write that and say that he really wanted to stay. And he did not converse with his agent enough. Yeah, it's, uh, and that, you know, unfortunately that's not an uncommon situation. Um, but that's, a, that's another topic is, is the Agents and the Players Association. <clears throat> In terms of Candlestick, I think you were saying that, that Horace never went down to visit that site in person um, or during construction. Um, I wasn't around then, and there are a number of stories that have floated around over the years um, about that and about the, um, uh, the fact that the lead architect, John Bowles, had never been involved in any way, shape, or form in designing a ballpark, major, a, a baseball park. Um, yeah, there were a lot of things about that ballpark that were just wrong. Um, the, the location, not, notwithstanding the wind and the weather, the location was bad. Uh, it was on the outskirts of town. Uh, it was in a ghetto. It was hard to get to. Um, there was a promise at the time that there was a bridge that was going to be called, that was called the Southern Crossing was going to be built a third, another bridge across the bay that would be south of the Bay Bridge that would link pretty much where Candlestick Point was with the East Bay. And then when that bridge, bridge was built, remember this was before there was an Oakland A's, that we would have direct transportation linkage to the East Bay. And that would be, a, that was another so-called selling point for that location for the ballpark. Of course, that bridge never got built. Um, they never were able to solve the problem with the wind or the cold. And um, that was just a, it, it just didn't work. It just didn't no. work in any way, shape or form. It's the Alamany Gap uh, that where the wind comes in from the ocean to the bay through the San Bruno Mountains. It's actually the windiest part of San Francisco. Yeah, and what the, what the wind experts told us when we started looking at uh, after Bob bought the club and, and he asked me to, to lead a group to try to figure out what we we're going to do about candlestick, one of the, we, we studied uh, ways in, in which we might be able to solve the problem there, including putting a dome on it. 
And what the climatologist told me was, and this, this was not new, this would have been reported before others had suggested it, that it was the hill right behind Candlestick that created the problem because the wind came in exactly as you suggest it did and then it hit that hill that was right behind the ballpark and it created what's called a venturi. I learned a lot about this in those days. <laughs> and what happens is when the wind hits a solid object, it bends and turns and picks up speed. And then it would slam across into the back of the ballpark and then climb over the top and come in. Now, before they enclosed it for football, it would then go out. Um, once they enclosed it for football, once it got in, it had no way to get out. And it just started swirling all over the place. Uh, and that so hill, that, that hill was the, was the dirt that they excavated to build Candlestick. That's uh, all that dirt made that hill. Yeah. And if that, so they say that if they had just taken the hill down, um, it, it might well have solved the problem. Corey, what about the thousand-page report about trying to dome candlestick? <laughs> well, we did. We it wasn't quite a thousand, but um, so we uh, we determined that the only solution was doming candlestick, and we knew that was a terrible solution, but that that had to be put forward preparatory to what we really thought was the right solution, which was a downtown ballpark. Um, and so we did issue a report. I don't remember what year. What nineteen eighty maybe. <clears throat> and uh, we talked about uh, the various alternatives, including doming candlestick and building a new downtown park. And that actually did create some momentum for the discussions that took place in the ensuing years for building a park downtown. And the taxpayers voted it down uh, twice in San Francisco, once in San Jose and once in Santa Clara. And yeah, then the Peter, Peter McGowan came along. And the second, the second one in San Francisco in 1989, um, <clears throat> where we wanted to build the ballpark in China Basin on the exact site where Oracle Park sits today, um, we were gonna win that election. But uh, two or three weeks before election day, we had the Loma Prieta earthquake. And that put the brakes to the campaign. Uh, we had to stop our campaign. We had to stop our absentee ballot effort. Um, and it also gave an opportunity for a fellow in Sacramento who wanted the team to move there to pour a bunch of money in to campaign against us, trying to setting up the false equivalency that you can't build a ballpark, you have to rebuild the city after the earthquake. Now we only lost by 1800 votes. And as a matter of fact, on election day, we got more yes votes than no votes but it was the absentee votes, um, today what you'd call mail-in votes. And uh, we had a, a whole campaign geared just to the absentee voters. And as a matter of fact, our first direct mail piece was gonna hit the Monday after the earthquake. We had to pull it back because of the earthquake. Um, so we really do believe that if it hadn't been for the earthquake and we've been able to go forward with our campaign as we had planned, we would have won that in 1989 and Bob would have built um, the ballpark that's there today because not only was that the site that we selected, but the architect that we selected um, was the architect that uh, the McGowan Group ultimately selected to design what is now Oracle Park. Yeah, and there was also the site at 7th and Brannon before uh, the site at Oracle <laughs> Park. Yeah, that was, that was the 1987 initiative. And that, that initiative, in my view, was our bad, it was a mistake. We shouldn't have done that. Uh, we had our reasons for going forward with it, but uh, it was a mistake. But nonetheless, 89 was our best shot. <clears throat> I mean, after all, we were in the World Series. Um, everybody loves a winner, right? And uh, all the elements were there. We had a mayor in Art Agnos who was uh, exceptionally supportive. Uh, he was behind at 100%. Um, we had a lot of community support. Bob put everything he had into the, into the campaign. We knew it would be close, but every poll we had, um, every projection we had showed us winning that thing. And uh, then the earthquake came along and that changed everything. And then there was the politician, I forget his last name, that co uh, convinced the taxpayers not to vote uh, for it. And then there was some, you know, as you mentioned, 
talk about moving to Sacramento? Well, I don't know which politician um, you're referencing, but there was a fellow by the name of Quentin Kopp who was on the board of supervisors who had ambitions to be mayor. Uh, never had the guts to run, but he had ambitions to be mayor. And uh, he was an opponent of Art Agnos. So we tried desperately to sit down with Quentin Kopp to walk him through uh, the plan. Because that ballpark uh, proposal in 89 was, was mostly privately financed. Um, it was on the same public land that Oracle is on now that we were going to pay a, a lease for. <clears throat> but Cop would never even sit with us to listen to the plan. Um, and he came out against it because uh, of his political ambition and, and his antipathy for Art Agnos. Uh, and he represented a part of the city, frankly, that had Quentin Cop supported it, even with the earthquake, I think we might, uh, we might have been able to win. So I'm not sure who you're talking about, but if there's one politician that you would ask me to point to as the guy who um, played a role in, in our defeat in 89, it would be Quentin Cop. Yeah, did Dan you know Taylor, he was a up, former... Dan. Dan, go ahead. Thanks, and thank you both for doing this. Uh, Corey and Mr. Leary, I, before coming on, I was on a lengthy phone call with a great friend of mine, John Van Ornum. And uh, given the news of the day, we were reminiscing about the work stoppage uh, when you guys were in control of the Giants. And John remembered that being in Chicago and that you, Mr. Lurie, were with the ball club. And he was laughing because he remembers the bus driver yanking all the players' luggage off the bus and tossing it all on the sidewalk and, and how perplexed the players were not knowing what they were going to do to get back home. But I, I'm curious when you see what we're going through now and the, the news of the day and the labor situation, uh, what memories that brings up, uh, hopefully not bad headaches uh, re being rekindled, but your thoughts on, I I'm curious what you guys went through and also uh, your thoughts on, on what baseball is going through today. Well, the labor situation in the 80s wasn't good. I think we went through four different work stoppages. Uh, only one of them actually cost uh, baseball any ball ballgames. Uh, that was, I think, the, the, in 84. But 81. It was, it was it 81? Um, but, you know, that was a very difficult time. Um, a lot of this was just new to baseball, the whole, the whole free agency thing, the whole union thing, Marvin Miller. Uh, and, and baseball, in many respects, at least in my view, looking back on it, didn't quite know how to deal with a lot of the stuff. Um, and that, that held through for ownership. It held through to, to the commissioner. Um, and it was, a, it was a difficult time in the the, the sort of black cloud that hung over baseball um, for, for, like I said, at least those four different work stoppages that we went through um, was debilitating. It really was. And, um, you know, I was, I, I heard somebody talking about the strike in 1994 today on the radio and talking about how horrible, tragic that was. And the fact of the matter is that was probably the one strike, the one work stoppage that had the most positive outcome for the game of any of them, because that's the last one. <clears throat> and that was, a, that, that was one where under the leadership of Bud Selig and, and ownership, um, baseball decided that the time had come that um, we, we had to, baseball had to show the Players Association that they meant business because uh, ownership had pretty much caved on, on a lot of the issues beforehand. And that was a painful strike and it was a terrible situation, but it reset the situation between baseball and the Players Association. And what came out of that strike was over a quarter century of labor peace. And uh, it changed the dynamics of the game, the financial dynamics of the game in, in such a way that, you know, everybody now is making money back in those days you know, there were few teams making money. Um, and unfortunately, you know, Bob's team was in the majority of those who weren't making any money. Now they're all making money and now the players are all millionaires. Um, so what's happening today is unfortunate. I've got my views on it. Um, it's unnecessary. I think um, it, uh, it, it's almost in a way from the player's point of view, the flip side of what I described 94 to be. I think the players feel as though in the last couple of, of collective bargaining agreements, they've gone backwards. 
And I think uh, part of this is the players wanting to reestablish um, the Players Association and, uh, and their needs. Uh, and of course, um, you know, ownership wants to protect a lot of the gains they made. But um, if somehow or other this situation impacts the beginning of the season in 2020, in my view, that will be tragic and completely unnecessary. Couple, I'd like to make a couple comments. First of all, I think it's the owners who have let this thing of salaries get so far out of hand. Uh, the agents are fabulous negotiators. I mean, the signings just before, on Monday, Tuesday, and before the shutdown were outrageous. Some of the three big signings, the millions and millions of dollars. Uh, just as a comment, when I sold in 90, of uh, three, uh, the average salary was just under a million dollars. Today, the average is well over four million and rising. Yeah, there are, there are some recent signings that are head scratchers. Um, I think some of this, though, you take a, you know, somebody asked me yesterday about the Max Scherzer signing. Uh, would you give a 37 year old pitcher a three year deal for $120 million? Um, it even goes back to the 10 year deal that the angels gave to Albert Pujols. Uh, what you do, what you have to do sometimes on those long-term deals is understand that what the team is doing is we used to call it deferred comp. They're basically saying, look, I'm willing to pay Max Scherzer $120 million. I don't expect three years out of him. I only expect maybe two. If I get a third, that's a bonus. And all I'm doing is amortizing $120 million two-year contract over three years. In addition, the luxury tax, the, the, pay, the annual payroll that the luxury tax is based on uses what they call average annual value. So if you sign Max Scherzer to a two-year $120 million contract, the average annual value is $60 million. And that's going to push you closer to the luxury tax threshold. If you spread it out over three years, the average annual value is $40 million. So there's some of those games going on too with these contracts today uh, as, as teams look to bring their average, average, average annual value of their contracts down to stay below the luxury tax. Um, Excuse me. Gary, I've got to cut out. But a pleasure to be with you, Corey. A great job, and I'll see you very soon. I will see you Thanks, soon, Bob. Gary. Bob, you stay well, Bob. There. Thank you so hey, much. Bob. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Lurie. It's Bob. At this point, it's Bob. Bob. Okay. <laughs> thank you for joining us, Bob. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, before Corey. we get to Renee, Corey, I got a question. I know you were uh, part of the transaction uh, transition team uh, when the Giants were sold to McGowan. I distinctly remember watching a game here in New York. Um, they marched around, and I think it was on the candlestick scoreboard. A guy from uh, Carolina, George Shin, had – what was the whole deal with that? Well, um, they were in a, a similar situation as Bob was in 76. Um, there was a conditional sale to Tampa, and let me say right now that that the, the last man in the world who wanted this team to go to Tampa was Bob Lurie. And uh, I never believed that the team was going to be leaving for Tampa. But the only way, uh, and Bob had the team on the market for several months before the Tampa deal. And again, it was like, like 1976. There was nobody from San Francisco willing to come forward and buy the team. Um, somebody said to me when I was bemoaning that, they said, Corey, you don't get a fire truck until there's a fire. And until it looked like the team was going to leave, um, there was nobody willing to come forward. Once it looked like the team may leave, then people were willing to come forward for, for varying reasons, some political, some other reasons. Um, so th that, that was the situation. But once, Bob, it was announced that the team was, was moving to Tampa, then there was a flurry of activity, uh, a lot of it led by Larry Bear. 
um, who, by the way, is a very, very dear friend and started out working um, as an intern for me. Um, and uh, Larry and I, I think he's one of the great baseball executives in the country, by the way. So Larry was looking to buy time. And one of these guys who came forward and said he would buy the team was George Shin. Well, George Shin had been around sports for a long time. And George Shin didn't have two nickels to rub together. Um, and we all knew that. But the media jumped on it. And uh, George Shin came to town. And you know, I'm going to buy the Giants. And I'm going to save the Giants. And blah, blah, blah. And Larry uh, brought him out to Candlestick. And they kind of walked around the ballpark and had all the TV cameras. And the whole idea here from Shin's point of view was maybe I'll get lucky and a bunch of rich people will come to me and want to be part of my group. Um, from Larry's point of view, he was trying to show that there was enthusiasm to keep the team in San Francisco and buy some additional time. But George Shin was never a serious buyer. Um, George Shin had been around, like I said, sports for a long time. And uh, he, he didn't have he didn't have that kind of money. Do you have a, do you have time for a few more questions? Sure. Renee, you're up. Um, jumping on uh, uh, your conversation with uh, uh, the strike, uh, I understand that one of the, uh, some of the issues that the players have is uh, free agency. Uh, uh, I forgot the other thing. Uh, but one of the other issues that I found interesting that's been talked about for a while was uh, clubs like, for example, uh, uh, Baltimore or Pittsburgh, who are tanking, uh, not spending any money. And the money goes and first uh, and first picks go to those teams and they just sit on it. They don't do anything. I think the, the Oakland players, A's and the, and the and the players want them want want those teams to play. And if you're not going to get the money, then, then don't get the first round draft. Pick. There was there was a, somebody mentioned something to me and I thought it was interesting. If you make the wild card, you should get a first round draft pick because people teams of those of, uh, 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 in the leagues like that who don't spend, who just sit there and just take on the money because they're in last place and just get first round draft picks and just trade, trade, trade. It's not helping the game and the competition as well as the players association. Your thoughts. Yeah. Well, that clearly is one of the issues uh, that the players are, are, are interested in. It's free agency. Uh, they don't like the qualifying offer uh, situation where uh, a team, if they make a qualifying offer uh, to a potential free agent and the free agent declines, and signs with another club, that club loses a draft pick to the original team. They don't like that. They don't like the tanking, so-called tanking issue. Um, there, there are a couple of other things that the players are, are concerned about. Um, I understand- Arbitration. You, pardon me? Arbitration. Arbitration. They wanted uh, yeah. to, uh, to go down and the length of time for free agency back a year and, and, uh, and the arbitration back. Right less one year right right so um and a lot of these things are are tied together um now baseball i understand did make a proposal um of going away from the if you finish last you get a first round pick more to the nba lottery style um which theoretically um could have an impact on the so-called tanking um but it's a legitimate issue um you know, the, the, the players certainly want less than six years before a, a, um, a player becomes a free agent. It's, a, it's, it's a both a combination of the time and what the players believe is uh, manipulation by teams in keeping players in the minor leagues um, a, 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 a requisite number of days to push their free agency out. That was an issue with Buster Posey. When we, when the Giants, I say we, when the Giants first brought up Buster Posey, they did it in May. So a sufficient number of days have gone by in the regular season that that season wouldn't, wouldn't give him six after he played the next five. Um, the, so the, one of the more recently celebrated cases of that was, was with Chris, Chris Bryan and the Cubs. So they don't like the six years and they don't like the fact that baseball can manipulate service time in order to get a little extra of uh, maybe four months out of a player like the Giants did with, with Buster Posey. Now, that never became an issue with Buster because the Giants signed him to a long-term contract and bridged the free agency. Um, 
baseball, I understand, has made a proposal um, then on free agency, instead of it being time of service, it be age. And I think their proposal was uh, once a player reaches 29 and a half years of age, he becomes a free agent. And that would obviously do away with the um, manipulation of service time. Now that may be 29 and a half is, a, is an age where you can negotiate on, I don't know. Um, uh, uh, arbitration is another issue. Uh, baseball has made the proposition that instead of arbitration, there be a mathematical formula that is determined that I think they want to tie to war, um, which is still a statistic um, I don't understand and never will and don't want to and don't give a damn about <laughs> um, But I'm hopelessly old school. Uh, so, I mean, there are things that are proposals that are going back and forth, but I think those are the, the key issues with the players, the qualifying offer, the arbitration, free agency, um, the, the, the tanking, which is tied to revenue sharing. Um, should clubs who do that be entitled to revenue sharing, uh, things of that nature? It's, how, it's, how do owners think, make think, out pardon me? Uh, when, when um, there was no people in the stands and would TV make up for all of that? No. For lost revenue in the stands, parking, concessions and all that? Are you talking about if there's a strike or are you talking about during COVID? I, during COVID. No, it didn't make up for all of it at all. Um, everybody lost money during the COVID season. Um, the, player, the players lost money. The teams lost money. Um, it was a very, very difficult situation all the way around. And TV didn't come close to making up the difference. But I also think one of the, one of the things that happened was that between the Players Association and, and the commissioner, um, I think they both, and I give probably a little more blame to the commissioner, to be honest with you, mishandled all of that um, negotiation between the two on the COVID season. And it became so contentious, unnecessarily so, um, that I think there's some carryover into the current, into the current situation. I looked at that situation um, prior to the beginning of the baseball season in, in 2020 and thought, what a golden opportunity for the Players Association in Major League Baseball to lock arms and say, this is a horrible situation for our country, for everybody in this country. Maybe baseball can play a positive, constructive role. We can do something together um, to, to help all of us get through this, but no. No, instead, while everybody was worrying about COVID and getting sick and dying, these groups of millionaires had to, had to have a very public fight screaming over, you know, the extra million dollars that was left on the table. It was horrible, it was very bad taste with the public. And I think it, it further exacerbated the relationship between the two that I think could, could impact where we stand today. Mm. All right, we're going to uh, go with two more questions. Um, Harvey Weinberg. Corey, thank you very much. Uh, this has been fascinating. Uh, I don't understand war either. And then there's the category of B war, which that totally throws me off. I have no idea what that is. Um, and I don't, need, I don't need someone to tell me the exit velocity to know that the ball was hit hard. <laughs> I can see with my own damn eyes if a ball's hit hard or not. Um, <laughs> all this stuff makes me nuts. But. Um, go, I want to go back uh, just briefly to 1994. Uh, you, you mentioned that strike as being uh, a key moment. Um, what I remember as a Giants fan was that Matty Williams was leading the league, I think, in home runs when yes. the stoppage occurred. No, that, that, that was not it. That wasn't 94. That was uh, the, the strike in the 80s where uh, the, the season was picked up. Remember, they, they took the season and broke it into two different halves. Yeah, it was around yeah. 81. That was the 81 strike. Right. And it turned out that the number of homers that Matt hit in 81 in that truncated season, for the, when, you, when you took the number of games there, and the number of games in 82 and you and they added up to 162 games when you i don't remember how many games we played in 81 but let's say there were 90 if you added 
the first 72 games from the 82 season, then uh, Matt would have broke um, Roger Maris's record. He would have hit more than 60 home runs if you prorated, uh, if you took the, the number of homers he actually hit in those 162 games over the two seasons. Well, my, yes, my, Matt was my, having a killer year in 81. Matt wasn't on the team. Yeah, I think it's no, 94, 94, Corey. you're talking about. It's 94. 94. I think it's 94, Corey. I, I, I think I'm, so, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely wow. right. Wow. No, now no, I got something second. to brag about. <laughs> no, no, wait a second. It was... <laughs> no, 94 season in 94, ended in August. In 90, you're right. He wasn't on the team in 81. But in 94... Yeah, the, the 94 team ended in... Uh, the season ended in August. The whole season ended, ended in 94. They didn't play the World Series. What was the year when they stopped mid-year and then resumed? And that, that was, was 81. 81. But 94, that, Matty had, I don't remember how many home runs he had. 41, I, I he believe. 41. He had 41? I guess you're right. You must be right. Well, then, then my follow-up question is irrelevant. Thing. It was the number of games that he missed in 94 that you added the 95. You're right. I'm sorry. I have right. my years all wrong. That's it. Yeah, right. that's right. Well, my question was going to be, what was, what was there any discussion? I mean, in that, you know, he, he would have broke, I, I felt he would have broken whatever the home run record was. I, I, I guess it was Maris's still at that point. Cause we, you, actually yes. it was Henry Aaron's, wouldn't it be? No, no, it was no, it was no, Maris. 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 He was going to Oh, the still. season record. I'm yeah, all because the season, season, season single season record. season record. Yeah. Yeah. Williams had 43 home runs when the season ended. Yeah. And he hit what another 19 or 20 in, in the beginning of the next right. season. Right. Oh, is That's, that yeah. I, the way I remember it, if you added the 162 games together, he would have had more than 61. That's a, yeah. yeah. That's right. Corey, when uh, when the McGowan team bought the uh, the Giants, and you helped with the uh, transition, did did you want to remain with them, or you were done? Well, um, I, I'm sure I would love to have remained, but it was very clear um, at that point that uh, Peter wanted Larry Bear in that role, and I felt very strongly that you know the new owner should have the right to have his own people. And I also understood that because of our failures in getting a new ballpark built, that one of the things that the new ownership group needed to do was put some distance between Bob and his group and the new group when it came to getting a new ballpark built. And they did that, not only in terms of personnel, but they did it by taking some time. They didn't jump into the new ballpark on day one. They invested some money in Candlestick to try to make it a little bit better. So um, I resigned. I offered my resignation. Uh, the handwriting was on the wall anyway because uh, I knew that that Peter. I'd known Peter for years. He'd been on our board of directors, and I knew that Peter wanted Larry in that role. And I understood their desire to put some distance. But would yeah. I love to stay? Yes. Would I love to stay in baseball? Yes. Um, there were some opportunities for me, but at the end of the day, um, to be quite honest, I was recently divorced. I had two young kids. Um, I wanted my children raised in San Francisco, and I didn't want to go live in, in Houston or some other place away from my kids. So the opportunity for me to remain in baseball at that point um, really wasn't there until um, I got an opportunity in, in 2000 when, when Commissioner Seelig I had opened up my own sports consulting firm and, and Bud uh, brought me on as, as a consultant to MLB in 2000. Thank you. Well, the we're biggest... Gonna, we're going to wrap it up with Dan, Dan from Albany. Actually, Corey just answered the question I was going to ask pretty much. So I don't have a question. All right, well, we go, we'll go. we go one more then. Fred Cohn. Hey, Corey, thank you. This has been fantastic. Really, really enjoyed it. My question... If you don't mind, if you don't want to speak about it, it's okay. But I'm kind of curious. On November 27, 1978, how did that affect you? Where were you, and how did it affect San Francisco? Good question. Well, it affected me very profoundly. Um, I had 
met George Moscone when I was still a student at UCLA in 1969. Um, in my, during my senior year, he offered me a job um, and said he would hold it for me until I graduated in June. Uh, to me, the opportunity to live in San Francisco and work for him was, was thrilling. Um, we became very close over the years and um, his death um, uh, affected me very, very deeply um, on, on many levels. Um, I was not in San Francisco that day um, and I'm kind of glad I wasn't. Um, and it was just, a, it was a horrible, horrible time um, not only for, for the mayor's family and for, for people like me who knew him well and were close to him, but for the city. Um, you know, it, it, uh, George Moscone was making some significant changes in San Francisco and doing a number of things um, that I and other people felt were, were good for the city. And um, uh, when he was killed, um, and Diane Feinstein became mayor, they were very, very different in terms of their political philosophies, their approach to governance. And um, she took the city in a, in a different direction. So, um, you know, I, I don't think there's, there's any question that, you know, political assassination on any level um, has a very profound and can have a very lasting impact. Uh, you know, we, we're all old enough to remember 1963 and I don't think there's any question that that changed the course of this country in a number of ways, um, as did the, the murders of Dr. King and Bobby Kennedy. So uh, I think it had a real impact on San Francisco um, uh, that's, that's being felt today. And I think uh, uh, Lincoln in, in uh, his book, uh, Year Zero, um, San Francisco in 1978, um, discusses that pretty well. Uh, he, has a, he has a pretty good handle on it. So. Yeah, that was uh, one of the darkest days in, of my life. And it's one that's still, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about it just the other day as the anniversary came around. It's hard for me to believe that um, it was what now, 40, 45 years ago? Yeah. Wow. Do the math from, no, 78, 43 years ago. That's a long time. Um, he had just celebrated his 49th birthday three days before he was, he was murdered. And that was 43 years ago. Corey, listen, we cannot thank you enough. Uh, as you can tell, even though this is a New York giant organization, most of the people in here still are uh, lifelong San Francisco fans as well. And you were a big part of uh, the team uh, turning it around. And cannot thank you enough for giving us some time tonight. So why don't we, no. nice round of applause for Corey Bush. Corey, well, thank no. you very much. I, I enjoyed it. The time flew by, and um, I hope you I hope you all enjoyed it. I certainly did. And uh, oh, it's great. It was great. And, and please, you. please thank know, you for the good questions too. Please know you're always welcome to join us. Not even as the guest speaker, just as a regular guy in the crowd. Please well, thank you me. very much. Appreciate it. And, uh, yes, thank you, Corey. Keep the giant you, flame Corey. burning in New York. We will. All Be right. well and uh, happy uh, Happy New Year. And thank Same you again. Same to, you. Same to all of you. Thank you. Come back, right, everybody. Uh, I will hang around here. Let me shut this off.